Hi, this is a view of Loch Kurusk on the Isle of Skye. And the question I've asked here is what's missing? If you look at this landscape, particularly uh, the lake on the, the right hand side there, you can see it sits at the bottom of a deep, steep sided, fairly flat bottom valley. A valley like that can only be formed by a glacier. Yet clearly, there's no glacier in this valley anymore. What I want to do in this lesson is talk about how the different environments that have existed through the Quaternary period have created a series of distinctive landforms and deposits that indicate what uh, those climates and those environments would have been like. If we think about the evidence that we can use then uh, to try to reconstruct these different climatically controlled environments from the Quaternary, we've got evidence from the landscape, from geomorphology, from the lithology of the sediments that we find, from the, the paleontology, the fossils, and perhaps as well, uh, the chemistry of the fossils or the rocks uh, that we find deposited. In this particular uh, lesson though, I don't want to discuss the geochemistry. I want to think more about the, the sediments and the landforms uh, that are created in these different environments. We'll leave the fossils as well for another lesson. So the types of environments that might be characteristic of the Quaternary are going to be related to the, the, the climatic conditions and the fluctuating climatic conditions that existed at this time. The environments we're talking about here are periglacial environments, glacial environments, fluvioglacial environments, and interglacial environments. Notice how that word glacial appears uh, in all four of these descriptions. Remember the Quaternary is dominated by periods of glaciation. We're going to focus in particular on the environments surrounding glaciers because they are uh, so important. The interglacial one we'll mention but um, it's these other three that I want to spend most time on. So if we think about the evidence that indicates a glacial environment. We've already looked at a, a glaciated valley uh, in the Isle of Skye. This is another example from Alaska, perhaps with a more recent glacier uh, that formed it. Notice the shape of the valley. Um, it's what we describe as a U-shaped valley. Very steep-sided, uh, relatively flat uh, bottom. This is caused by glacial erosion. A glacier plowing down this, uh, probably a pre-existing river valley, widening it, deepening it, steepening it. It's a very distinctive glacial feature. Here we can see uh, a glacial valley um, still with its glacier in, although the glacier here clearly is shrinking. If we look at the side of the valley here, um, we can see uh, if you're almost like a tide mark uh, on the rock, place where the rock has been been polished by the action of the glacier moving over the top of it, um, leaving uh, a mark behind uh, on this boundary between the, the polished, smooth, glaciated rock and the more angular, unglaciated rock uh, above that. We can use this to try and reconstruct the, the extent of ice sheets uh, from the Quaternary. If we look closer at the uh, rocks that are polished by the ice, we see features like this. These are gla glacial striations. The ice, uh, with rocks frozen into the base of it, uh, will polish and scratch uh, the bedrock as it passes over the top of it. 
We can see from this the direction that the ice is moving. And crucially, the fact that this particular piece of bedrock was at some point underneath a glacier. As these glaciers move, they can be transporting sediment. Here we can see these long lines of, um, of rock, uh, the darker areas on the ice sheet, uh, being eroded and transported by uh, the ice, um, producing these long strips. Now, when the ice melts, these uh, strips of rock get deposited to form ridges of sediment. Um, either as what we call lateral moraines at the side of where a glacier was, or as a medial moraine, uh, a ridge of sediment running down the middle uh, of an ice sheet, particularly, as we can see here, where you've got two tributary glaciers joining each other. At the end of a glacier, where the ice melts, we can see... Um, all the sediment, all the rocks and the, the clasps being transported by the ice, being dumped to form this, this ridge of very distinctive sediment um, at the end of a, of a glacier. We describe this as a terminal moraine, showing us how far down a slope uh, a glacier uh, was able to travel. Now these glacial moraines, here's an example from Alaska, have a very distinctive lithology. They are um, very poorly sorted. Glaciers don't sort out sediment. Uh, they uh, deposit everything they're carrying at the same time when the ice melts. As a result, we see a very poorly sorted uh, sediment that is also unstructured. Uh, it's just a, a large mass of similar material. You'll see that the class here also very angular because there's no, no attrition going on within the glacier uh, for this transported sediment. The composition of this will reflect the geology uh, of the area that the, that the glacier has flowed across. A fluvial glacial environment, then, is deposited in a river, either underneath or at the end of a glacier. Dominant. Here we see uh, the end of, a, of an ice sheet. Uh, we've got uh, some fairly uh, dirty looking ice on the right hand side of the image. Uh, and we can see uh, glacial outwash, some uh, meltwater coming out of the, uh, from the uh, front of this glacier. And we start to see what's happening. If we contrast the sediment here with what we saw from the glacial deposition, we can see that this is better sorted. The fine material here has been washed further downstream. There start to be some rounding of these uh, rocks as they start to get uh, moved around by the water. So we can see the effect of fluvial processes relatively quickly um, once uh, water becomes the agent of transport and erosion rather than ice. The rivers that we get coming out of glaciers are often choked with sediment. So typically we'll see these large braided river deposits um, where channels uh, split and, and rejoin further downstream as um, uh, those individual channels then sort of silt up and, and choke up with sediment and then the river has to find a new way uh, to work its way down slope. The deposits that we see uh, in a fluvial glacial environment will show more organisation. They'll be better sorted. Um, we, we can see here we've got uh, more rounded grains um, as, the, as the attrition has, has done its thing in the, uh, in the outwash river. We may even see uh, sedimentary structures, uh, imbrication of pebbles, or as we can see near the top of this sequence, some cross bedding going on. An unusual feature of fluvial glacial sediments are where we get subglacial rivers and we get the formation of a feature called an esker. An esker is a ridge of fluvial glacial sediment. Here's an example from Manitoba. We can see running down the middle of the image a meandering ridge 
of fluvioglacial sediment. Now, normally we'd expect rivers to deposit in a channel that erodes down into the bedrock. But in, in subglacial rivers, these channels will find it easier to erode uh, the ice above. Uh, that channel then will fill with sediment. And when the ice melts, this is what's left behind. A periglacial environment then is one that surrounds a glacier. So we have the effect of a glacial climate without being under ice itself. What we get as a result is extreme freeze-thaw weathering. And that has a number of different effects. This is a hillside in the Cairngorms in northern Scotland. It um, is subject to a process we call solifluxion. This is where the top surface of sediment on the um, on the hill slope uh, will thaw out, become quite wet and mobile, start moving down the slope before it freezes again. We see as a result from this some alignment of the clasts and these distinctive uh, lobe-like uh, little mini ridges on the side called solifluxion lobes. This can't form underneath the ice. This must form in the environment that surrounds the ice. This extreme freeze-thaw weathering has other effects as well. The feature you can see in this photograph is an ice wedge. It's where uh, free, repeated freezing and thawing of um, wet uh, sediment has um, opened up uh, a deep crack uh, in that sediment, which has then been filled in by the deposition of later material. Again, it's an indicator that we've got these uh, f extreme freeze-thaw weathering conditions in a periglacial environment. In the areas that uh, stick out between ice sheets, so high up in the mountains, we get the formation of uh, a feature we call nun attacks. These are um, extreme frost-shattered boulders that um, form in this uh, intense freeze-thaw environment uh, in the area around the ice sheet. This particular example uh, from the Glidders in Snowdonia uh, is really quite a spectacular uh, example of this, uh, this boulder field created by freeze-thaw weather. If we compare that with rocks lower down the mountain, we don't see this same degree of frost shattering because the, the rocks there will have been polished by the ice. These can't have been. Also in a periglacial environment, we get the deposition of a very fine-grained aeolian sediment called loess. This stuff is ex it's, it's rock dust. The type of rock dust and rock flour that gets uh, generated by the grinding of rock uh, along the base of a, uh, of a glacier uh, that's very easily mobilized by the wind then uh, when it dries out. Uh, this stuff is, is generally pretty dreadful uh, stuff. It causes all sorts of uh, engineering problems where we get uh, significant de deposits of it. It's extremely well sorted, extremely fine grained, uh, and very, very easy to erode. Finally, then, I briefly want to mention an interglacial environment. An interglacial environment are the warm conditions, for example, like we're experiencing at the moment. But remember, this is all about characteristic uh, deposition. There's lots of deposition occurring at the moment for example, in rivers or on beaches, but that isn't characteristic of the warm conditions that we experience. One of the sediments that is characteristic that can't form in glacial environments is peat. This is partially decomposed plant material that uh, accumulates over time in waterlogged conditions uh, and can only form uh, 
where conditions are right for the growth of plants, so in an interglacial environment. Uh, and it does give us a good indication in, in, in sequences, particularly in upland areas, uh, of um, the short, warmer, interglacial environments. So, as we see the sunset over Kassethi Gwent on top of the, the glitters, an example of one of these uh, non-attack environments, we've seen that these different climatic conditions, these different environmental conditions that exist during the Quaternary can each create their own distinctive set of deposits and landforms. As geologists, we can use these to reconstruct the changes in climate that have occurred throughout the, the period of the Quaternary. And if we put them together in, in, in sequences, we can actually start to interpret the, the change in those conditions. If you've got any questions, bring them along to class. I'll see you then.